Can you turn with me this morning to the book of Ezekiel? The book of Ezekiel. Now, there's a great book to find. The book of Ezekiel. The book of Ezekiel. It's just after Lamentations, which is just after Jeremiah. The book of Ezekiel. The book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 1. I'm going to be reading this morning from verse 15. It's a description of God, and uh, as Ezekiel sees the Lord appear before him and uh, at the Kiba River, he says, As I looked at the living creatures, I saw a wheel on the ground beside each creature with its four faces. This was the appearance of the structure of the wheels. They sparkled like chrysolite, and all their four looked alike. Each appeared to be made like a wheel intersecting a wheel. As they moved, they would go in any one of four directions. The creatures, which would be angels, faced the wheels, did not turn about as the creatures went. Their rims were high and awesome, and all four rims were full of eyes all around. When the living creatures moved, the wheels beside them moved. And when the living creatures rose from the ground, the wheels also rose. Wherever the Spirit would go, they would go, and the wheels would rise along with them, because the Spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. When the creatures moved, they also moved. When the creatures stood still, they also stood still. And when the creatures rose from the ground, the wheels arose along with them, because the Spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. Spread out above the heads of the living creatures was what looked like an expanse, sparkling like ice and awesome. Under the expanse, their wings were stretched out, one towards the other, and each had two wings covering its body. When the creatures moved, I heard the sound of their wings, like the roar of rushing waters, like the voice of the Almighty, like the tumult of an army. When they stood still, they lowered their wings. Then there came a voice from above the expanse, over their heads as they stood with lowered wings. Above the expanse, over their heads, was what looked like a throne of sapphire. And high above the throne was a figure like that of a man. I saw that from what appeared to be his waist up, he looked like glowing metal, as if full of fire. And that from there down, he looked like fire, brilliant light surrounded him. Like the appearance of a rainbow in the clouds on a rainy day, so was the radiance around him. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. When I saw it, I fell face down, and I heard the voice of one speaking. Let's bow our heads and pray before the King. <clears throat> Gracious and eternal God, we thank you, Lord, for the wonderful privilege of being able to gather together this morning to study your word again. And Lord, it's a wonderful privilege that certainly at the end of each week, as your people, we can gather around your word, the word of the living God, that we can look into it, that we can hear your word to us for today and for tomorrow and for each day leading up to the next lesson. Lord, may you glorify your name, speak into our hearts and extend your kingdom. May your Holy Spirit move up and down the aisle and amongst the pews. May your Holy Spirit touch each and every one of our hearts, opening our eyes, starting with my own, and glorify your name for Jesus' sake. And God's people say, Amen. Amen. This morning we pick up on our study into worship again. And today we're going to be looking at how to glorify God in worship. How to glorify God in worship. Are you curious? How do we as a people here today glorify God? God in our worship? How do we live a life as Christians where our innermost being turns and responds with praise to God for all that God actually is? So that our lives, your life, my life, exalts God continually on a daily living basis. How do we actually do that? How do we live in that way? Well, firstly, I need to say to you that worship is not mystical. It's not mystical. Instead, it is intensely practical. 
in that glorifying God as is, is active, it is dynamic, it is alive, it is vibrant, it is living, it pulsates literally through our minds and bodies, it fills our hearts and our and our wills. It's not you and I going off quietly necessarily and sitting in some quiet place piously dreaming and contemplating some abstract epithelial concept. No. Worship to God is deliberate and it is purposeful. It involves not just yours and my thoughts on a daily basis, but our whole beings as individuals as well. So that we could really put it this way this morning, the, the, the life of you as a true worshipper of God is to be joyous, it is to be vibrant, it is to be exciting, it is to be a life actively seeking to glorify God in every known practical way possible. Now that is the thing with worship. Worshipping God, remember this, is always practical. Now, the Bible is very specific about how you and I as a people are to go about worshipping God in a way that is acceptable to God Himself. And this is what I would like to really touch on and for you and I to sit back and think about and look at today. And the first response that God considers as an act of pure and acceptable worship to Him and Him alone in the light of what Jesus Christ, His only Son, came into this world to do at Good Friday is that in our lives there is to be firstly confession of sin. And that is something that is intensely practical, isn't it? Confession of sin. If we're to worship God properly, the very first thing that we need to do is there needs to be in our lives confession of sin. And incidentally, this is why when we start our services here at Christ Church Boxburg, you've noticed that over the period of time, we always start with confession. There is always confession. And then we move on to assurance of God's forgiveness in our lives. And then we move on with the rest of the service. But if we're to worship God and we're to give the God of glory, glory, we start firstly with confession of sin. In 1 John 1, 9, John says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just, and He will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Now the word confess there is an ancient Greek word, homologio, which comes from the union of two Greek words, homo, meaning the same, and logos, meaning expression. And so what confess actually means in terms of God is that when we confess our sins, one is saying that one is in full agreement with God. One is saying what God is actually saying concerning our responsibility in life over sin and the awfulness of what sin is and how sin affects our relationship to a holy God. We are agreeing with God. Now we don't often think of confession of sin as worship. But you know it is. For when we as saved sinners, redeem people which we are, turn and confess our sins to God, we are humbling ourselves spiritually before the God of heaven and earth. We are humbling ourselves before His throne and we're acknowledging the rule of God's holiness over our own lives. And we are proclaiming God's faithfulness, we're proclaiming God's righteousness. We're proclaiming God's perfection into our own persons. That our God, who is faithful and righteous himself, is a God who forgives us our sins. And then in turn, think about this, when we confess our sins, we're accepting any discipline that God may give us for our sins, and therefore we are glorifying God for the discipline that He meets out to you and I. We are saying, God, You are holy, You are just when we confess our sins, You are right about my sin, my sin destroys our relationship with You, we agree with everything that You say, and Lord, when it comes to Your discipline in our lives, we fully accept it. In fact, when we come to God in confession of sin, it actually turns and prepares our hearts and our minds to worship a holy God. 
for it is acknowledging who God is and where we actually stand before God, before the creator of the universe. Wow. In Hebrews 9 verse 14 it says, Cleansing of sin purifies our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve, the Greek word is laturio, meaning worship, the living God. Confess cleansing of sin purifies our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may worship the living God. To worship God, we need to confess our sin. And so we need to approach God in the right way. In the Old Testament, we have the account there of a man called Achan, who is an eternal example to you and I of how God is glorified by the confession of sin. And that Achan was a man who disobeyed God. He went and stole treasure from the city of Jericho. God commanded the people of Israel not to take anything from Jericho, and Achan disobeyed. And that's how you remember him. He was just Achan to steal something. In fact, he went further in that. He thought that if he went and buried that treasure under his tent, God wouldn't see it. But God saw right through the dirt. And God was so displeased with Achan that the entire nation of Israel was to suffer for it. To the point that Israel was defeated at the battle of Ai, a tiny little rabbi with lights. And the entire Israeli army was sent fleeing. Thousands of soldiers died in that battle. Husbands and sons never came back from it. As a graphic illustration that God cannot and will not bless sin in our lives. Sometimes perhaps a family can suffer because of our sin. And Joshua, who was leading Israel, was absolutely heartbroken by it. And he turned and he inquired of God as to why Israel as a nation had been defeated in battle. A nation that had marched through the Red Sea. A nation that had marched to Sinai. Had been given the commandments of God. Had had suffered victory after victory and suddenly totally defeated. And when Joshua realized what had gone and happened, and Israel as a nation stood before him according to their tribes, and Achan's sin was about to be revealed. Joshua 7.19 it says, Then Joshua said to Achan, My son, give what? Glory to the Lord. How? The God of Israel, and give him praise. Tell me what you have done, your sin, and do not hide it from me. Wow. Joshua there made the logical co connection between the confession of sin and glorifying God in our lives. Confession of sin and glorifying God. And it's an appropriate parallel, isn't it? In that when we turn and we confess our sins to God, it glorifies God in our lives. It exonerates God and acknowledges that God is an extremely holy, righteous God and being. And He will act in judgment against any form of evil in our own lives and thought, word, and deed. And that stops anyone from pointing a finger at God and turning around and saying, God is unjust to us. Why isn't God blessing us, perhaps? And so it gives Him glory. Why? Because we've confessed where we are wrong. That, but when we excuse our sins in our lives, Refusing to acknowledge our responsibility for our sins to God. What we are doing, do you realize this, is actually blaming God for judging us. Blaming God for saying that there is, that there is an issue in our lives. You know, God, I don't think I've got an issue. How can you not bless me? How can these issues come into my life? Who are you to tell me that I am a sinner? It's unjust, God. I don't have an issue with my life. I don't want to discuss it with you. And that's something that Adam went and did after he sinned. And then instead of acknowledging his own personal sin before God, confessing God was right in his own life, he tried to lay the blame elsewhere. In Genesis 3 verse 12, it says that he said to God, The woman, what? You put here with me. She gave me some of the fruit of the tree and I ate it. Now, at first sight, it might appear there that Adam is actually blaming the woman for the sin and the disaster that fell into his own life and their relationship. But if you look closely at that verse, what it shows us is that Adam was actually blaming God who went and gave him Eve. 
You know, God, my life was perfectly fine in the garden, and then you brought this woman into my life, and now look at me. In that ultimately, he was saying God was responsible for the situation in which Adam now lived. He was assigning God the blame in his life for his own personal disaster. He was casting imperfection on the holy character of God. Do you see that? In Revelation chapter 16, verse 8 and 9, the Apostle John reminds, uh, regard, records an interesting statement there on the description of the plagues that God is going to pour out in the world in the last seven years of world history under the Antichrist. It says in Revelation 16, 8, The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and the sun was given power to scorch people with fire. They were seared by the intense heat, and they cursed who? The name of God, who had control over these plagues. But, watch this, they refused to repent and what? Glorify God. You see, to acknowledge their sin and repent, as Achan was called to do, would have been an admission to the world that in God punishing the world for its sin, God was right. It would have glorified the name of God. It would have said to the world, Our God that we worship is holy and just. But you see, man in sin feels guilty. And he runs away from God. When Adam went and sinned, he went and hid when God walked through the garden in the cool of the day. And God said to him, Where are you, Adam? And he said, I'm hiding because I heard you coming. And man has been hiding ever since. Man does not want to glorify the God of heaven and earth. But when we confess sin to God, we give God glory. And it's a very powerful thing to think about. We don't just rush into the presence of God in praise and worship. Secondly, we not only give God glory, but, we, uh, but secondly, we give God glory uh, when we trust Him unquestionably. When we trust God implicitly. When we believe God concerning everything in His Word. You see, in your life, trust in God or faith is absolutely foundational for worship. It's not just coming to confess sin before God, but it's secondly, believing our God. It's trusting our God. In Romans chapter 4.20, God's Word says on, on, on this to Abraham, Abraham did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his what? Faith, faith, and gave glory to God. Faith gives glory to God. Confession of sin gives glory to God in terms of worship. Now, every Christian will turn around and say that our God is trustworthy and true. Amen? And that God is a God who keeps His word. But so few Christians live lives of total trust in God that the world, think about this, the world isn't always sure that our God is trustworthy. How often do we doubt, myself included, Think about it. Or that God's word, the Bible, is all that God actually says God is. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 10, it says, Anyone who does not believe God has made him out to be a liar. Or in other words, when you doubt God in his word, you make him appear to the world as a liar. For example, something just to think about in God's word. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, it says... No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, He will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. Now, if we turn around and we say that we cannot bear temptation, that temptation is just too much in our lives, we can't cope with that temptation, and that we are being tempted beyond what we can bear, we call God a liar. Because God is saying something different in His Word. Now for some reason, we tend to think of doubt and worry as small sins in life. Don't we? But when a Christian shows unbelief in God's promises and an inability to cope with life because of endless worries, he is saying to the world, my God cannot really be trusted. My God can't be trusted. His Word is not realistic to life. 
And that is no small sin, for it's calling God a liar. A good example of a strong and unwavering faith, something for you and I to aspire to in life, is the account of the three young men in the fiery furnace of Daniel chapter 3. In that we read there that before King Nebuchadnezzar threw these three godly young men into a fiery furnace because they would not worship him as king, Nebuchadnezzar gave them a choice, a chance literally, to save their own lives, deny their God and bow down and worship me. In Daniel chapter 3 verse 17, we find their answer to him. They said to Nebuchadnezzar, If we are thrown into the blazing furnace... The God we serve is able to save us from it. And he will rescue us from your hand, O king. But even if he does not, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you've gone and set up. These three godly young men were in an extremely difficult and dangerous position. No other children of God in the the Bible is ever recorded as being taken before a fiery furnace to be thrown into that furnace. They could never turn around and say, Joel, do you remember those young men that were thrown into a furnace in, in the days of David or in the days of Solomon? There was nobody. Which means that there was no example for them to follow. There were no scripture verses that they could suddenly quote to one another or perhaps look up somehow to be able to say, well, do you remember in 1 Chronicles chapter 5, it says this, there was nothing that they could fall back on. But nevertheless, they rejected King Nebuchadnezzar's offer of life. They rejected their own lives for the truthfulness of God's holy word. Taking a confident stand of faith in God's justice. Believing what the Bible says about God. And their faith in God was shown to be true. And God was glorified and God was exalted. Not only before a godless king, but before an entire nation because of it. Our God is glorified in a life of worship when we turn and we trust God implicitly. Without question. Without doubt, if God says it, we believe it. In that if God stands by His word, you stand by it. Without doubt, even to the point of death, trusting and believing in God. The third way that we glorify God in worship, when we live a life, is to live a life of fruitfulness. Fruitfulness. Fruitful Christians glorify God. Fruitful Christians glorify God. In John 15 verse 8, Jesus said, This is to my Father's, what? Glory, that you bear, what? Much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Bearing fruit or living a life for God in our Christianity is absolutely crucial. You see, living a Christian life is not just ambling through Monday and ambling through Tuesday and ambling through Wednesday. Living a Christian life is bearing fruit for the kingdom of God. Showing God to the world, to our friends and to our family and to people at work by the way we live and by the way we speak and by the way we think and by the way we act. It's an essential part of true worship. Fruit. A dynamic life for Christ. In Colossians 1.10 it says, And we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy, or worship, of the Lord and may please Him in every way, bearing what? Fruit in every good work. Wow. Now that verse explains and shows what Christian fruit in our lives actually is. Are you ready for this? Look at that verse. It's our good works. The fruit we bear for the name and the glory of God and the kingdom of God is good works. See that? In Ephesians chapter 5, 8, it says to us as Christians, For you were once darkness, in other words, wicked, lost, but now you are in the light, saved, in the Lord. Live as children of light, live as Christians. For the fruit of the light consists in all what? Goodness and righteousness and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. In Galatians 5.22, it expands on what it means to live a life of goodness and righteousness and truth. 
in that in terms of, God, uh, of good works, it's something that is to affect our attitudes. It's to affect our actions. It's to affect our lives. Paul in Galatians chapter 5 verse 22 puts it this way. But the fruit of the who? Spirit, God, is what? Love and joy and peace and, and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Those are to show in our lives. Those are the attitudes and the actions being spoken of here in the Word of God. Hein, the German philosopher, once said, You show me your redeemed life, and I will believe in your Redeemer. You show me your saved Christian life, and I will believe in your Saviour. You see, the spiritual fruit we bear as Christians is not only our act of worship to God, but it is an evidence of the character of the God that we worship to the world in us. We are bearing God's character if we are Christians to the world. Or let me put it this way. Just as literal fruit on a tree is a genetic reproduction of the parent tree, that fruit comes from the parent tree, it's an example, a picture of that tree. So our spiritual fruit as Christians is a reproduction of the character of our heavenly parent, God. If people want to see the character and the life of God we worship, they should be able to turn and look at your life. If people want to see what God is like, they need to be able to look at your life how you care, how you show compassion, how you reach out to others, your life. This is why the Bible draws a line between two characters when you look at the Word of God and you split it in two. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 19, there is what is called the acts of the sinful nature. We are called to avoid it. This is the character of the world around us. And as we look at these, verse, these verses now, just think of the world around us. Think of the folk at work. Just think of the world. Galatians 5.19. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality. It's rife. Impurity of thought and action. And debauchery. Idolatry. It's putting other things in the place of God. And witchcraft. It's fortune telling and astrology. Hatred and discord. Unforgiveness. Jealousy. Fits of rage. Selfish ambition. Dissensions. Factions and envy. Drunkenness and orgies and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, in Galatians 5.22, we find by comparison God's character now reflected. The way that you and I as Christians should be living to glorify God in our own daily lives and in our worship. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness, and gentleness, and self-control. That is the character that we should be bearing, God's character. Are we perfect? No. Will we fail? Yes. But what do we do? We get back up on the bicycle. It's a reflection of the God we worship. To worship and glorify the God that we serve is to bear fruit for the kingdom of God. We fail, we get back up and we say, Lord, I'm going to try harder, I'm going to try again. And we show that love and gentleness and peace and patience and care that God has called us to show to others. Fourthly, we glorify God and worship by verbally praising Him with our mouths. By praising God with our mouths. In Psalm 50 verse 23, God says, Whoso offereth praise glorifieth me. Whoso offereth praise glorifies me. What is praise? What is praise? Well, praise and worship is simply you and I exalting God by reciting God's character. What he is like. Reciting God's works. What God has actually gone and done. And turning around and thanking God for what he is. For what God has accomplished in your lives. When you look at the Psalms, many of the Psalms that we read are pure expressions of that kind of praise and worship. 
reciting the character of God, reciting the great works that God has done, how God saved Israel through the Red Sea, how God came down on Mount Sinai, how God blessed Israel in the desert with food. In Psalm 107, we constantly read this statement, for example, Oh, that men would praise the Lord for His goodness and for His wonderful works to the children of men. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for His goodness and for His wonderful works to the children of men. Wow! Do you know that the best way to praise and to trust God in in the present is to study God's works from the past? You want to praise God now? Look back to the past. Look at what God has done. For God has already established a pattern of faithfulness. It's his track record. You look at any company or government or whatever, you look at the track record to see where they'll be in the future. And that's what we look at here. We look at God's faithfulness in the past. Look at how God has gone and dealt with the lives of his servants in Scripture. God's faithfulness to Abraham throughout his life and to Isaac and to Jacob to Moses and to Joshua, to Peter, to James and to John. How God dealt with the nation of Israel time and time again. Just to mention a few. Or consider God's wondrous works as a continual reminder that God has never proven to be unfaithful to His people. You might be going through difficulties at the moment in your life. You might be sitting back and thinking, woe is me, will God ever turn the light on and get me out of the trouble I'm in? God has never proved unfaithful. We need to trust Him, even in the darkest times. Or think, for example, of when God went and made animal skins to make atonement for Adam and Eve's sin after they sinned in the Garden of Eden. He could have destroyed them. They were unfaithful to Him. But you know what? God rose up and He protected their lives. Or God's design of the ark during the days of the flood to protect one man and his family and a few animals. Or God sending two angels into the city of Sodom and Gomorrah to save a man and his family. Or God's opening of the Red Sea to save an entire nation. A people who were disobedient to him, but in love he still opened that sea and saved Israel. Or we could go go to God concerning his faithfulness in so many other areas. Think of how God has helped you as an individual and your family over the years. How he's always been there. How he's redeemed you. When you're being financially strapped, suddenly he's there. When when you're needing help, suddenly he's comforting you, uplifting you and guiding you all the way through, constantly. God always is faithful. When we as his people even prove unfaithful. When we remember these things and we recite them verbally as an act of worship, we glorify the God of heaven and earth. Perhaps it's good to keep a diary and write down all the wonderful things that God has done. And when you're on your knees, you one needs to bring it out. To say thank you to God is an act of worship. In Luke 17, verse 11, we have a story there of some lepers. Now in Israel, lep- leprosy was seen as a, an outcast disease. You stayed away, that person was unclean. You didn't want to get to have it, it was contagious. Luke 17, 11. Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, go and show yourself to the priests. And they went and they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back, what? Praising God in what? A loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, Were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Was no one found to return and what? Give praise to God except this foreigner? The foreigner worshipped Jesus, the Son of God, by verbally saying, Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Praising God for His wonderful work of grace in His life. And in worship, He brought glory to God. Thank you. Just thank you. And then finally, we give glory to God. Are you ready? When we pray. When we pray. Worship and prayer are absolutely inseparable to the glory of God. Never minimize your prayers. In John 14, uh, uh, 14 verse 13, 
We have an incredible statement there uh, that prayer glorifies God. Jesus said in John 14, 13, And I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. Wow. Now that doesn't mean that we can ask Jesus for anything, anything in his name. and He's just going to do it for us. Lord, you know, I'd really like to be the king of Sweden. It's not a chance, and Jesus makes you the king of Sweden the next day. Instead, the key word in John 14, 13 is the word, Ask in my name, says Jesus Christ. Now, praying in the name of Jesus, according to, the, uh, to Scripture, is praying according to the character of Jesus. It's praying on behalf of Jesus. What would be in line with Jesus' desires for your life as the living God? Or to put it this way, would Jesus pray that? Lord, give the minister a Porsche 911. Would Jesus pray that? No. In that what you are praying for is to be in line with the holy character of a righteous God. If it is, then you pray it. And where do you get to know the character of God? Well, through His Word. By reading and studying the Word of God, the Bible. The point is, if you want to worship God correctly, you worship God when you pray, and in doing so, praying according to the character of a holy God. Would Jesus pray that? And so we glorify God in our worship when we confess our sins, when we trust God implicitly, when we live fruitful and godly lives, when we praise God from our mouths verbally, praise God, we need to shout it out. And when we pray, wow. May God challenge each and every one of us in our daily worship here to confess, to trust, to bear fruit, to praise, and to pray. Let's bow before the King. <clears throat> Perhaps God has touched your heart in some way. To confess, to trust, to bear fruit in our lives, to praise and to pray. There's so many ways we can glorify God. Those are just a few. Why don't you just speak to the Lord for a moment? To confess, to trust to bear fruit, a dynamic Christian life, to praise, to pray. Gracious and eternal God, we just want to give you praise and glory and honour for being such a righteous and a holy God. Lord, so many times we have been unfaithful. We haven't always honoured you. We haven't always trusted you. And I speak for my own life. And your word says sometimes that we, because of our behaviour, we call you a liar. Lord, where we have failed you, forgive us. Lord, you are righteous and holy. And may we always remember that to confess our sin, we bring glory to you. May we be a people this morning who rise up above the ways of this world and may we trust you implicitly. Trust your word, not doubt you as God. If you say it is this, it is this. If you say that you will bless us, you will bless us. If you say that you will help us, you will help us. As it says in Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11, that you're a God who is always there. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Then you'll come and pray to me and call upon me and I will hear your word and I will be found by you, declares the Lord. Lord, may we believe your word and trust and believe. May we live a fruitful life, bearing fruit for the kingdom of God. Lord, we don't just get up in the morning and go home and feel that the day's been a waste, but Lord, we live a life where we glorify you. We're on a purpose. We've got a mission for the kingdom. Our lives are to bear fruit. 
Every day of our lives is to be something new and joyful and dynamic because it's for the kingdom of God, for your glory. And Lord, may we constantly be ready to praise you. Lord, to be able to say to somebody, praise God, praise God, and to mean it. And Lord, to pray, to live a life where we pray, Lord, not only on our knees in the morning and the evening and perhaps in the midday, but to pray, Lord, as we drive down the road, as we walk in the fields, as we walk in the shopping center, to pray quietly in our minds, to be a people who glorify you. Help us to worship you for Jesus' sake. And God's people say, Amen. Amen.